I know as we embark on this, some people will say, I don't know all the right theological answers. I don't know the right things to say. I don't have enough experience sharing my faith. How can I possibly tell someone about the gospel? I had the opportunity this past week to do a chapel for the lower school at Wardlaw. So I don't know, 100 kids? How many kids? About 100 kids, you know, uh, ranging from K3 all the way up to fifth grade. And I was talking about how they are loved. And as I did that, I felt the need to back up, you know, bullying is a major problem. I'm not saying it's a major problem at Wardlaw, but it's a major problem in our society, especially among these little kids. And so one of the things I started out with was telling them that you are just the way God designed you. You are just the way he wanted you. You say, well, I'm not smart enough. No, thank you. Jesus Christ knit you together in your mother's womb. Psalm 139. It says he numbered the hairs on your head. Anybody have a guess as to how many hairs we have? It's roughly 120,000 hairs. Some have more, some have less. But you have 120,000 hairs on your head on average. And there's almost 7 billion people in the world. God knows 120,000 times 7 billion. He knows that many hairs. He knows you that intimately. He certainly knows how smart you are. And that's what He made you for. Jesus Christ knows how athletic you are. And He designed you to be just like that. He knows how charismatic and how funny you are. And that's how He designed you. And then in Jeremiah chapter 1, he tells Jeremiah, I made you and I called you to this service. I called you to this ministry. You see, Jesus Christ didn't just give Travis musical abilities by accident. He gave him musical, musical abilities and he called him as a pastor before Travis was even born. Before he was even knit together in his mother's womb, Scripture tells us that God knew him. And God knows you. You are just as he designed you. So when you say, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't know enough, what you're saying is, God, you made a mistake. And no, thank you, God does not make mistakes. He has called you. You, Chuck. And he's called you, Warren. James Earl. And he's called Travis and he's called Doug. He's called everyone in this room to tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ. To personally take it upon themselves to tell someone that Jesus Christ loves them. And if you don't plan for that, guess what? It'll probably never happen. You'll start talking about a hurricane. Or you'll start talking about how hot it is outside. Or you'll start talking about how good or how bad your football team is. Depending on who you root for in South Carolina. Other things will come to your mind. Other things will take the place because we are sinful, we are fallen, and we make the little things way too important. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. What I want you to hear this morning is that Jesus Christ doesn't call the superstars. He doesn't call the rock stars, although He may, and He does use them from time to time. He does use the men like Billy Graham, who you're sitting there going, how in the world can someone be that good at speaking? But he also calls the Peter, who sticks his foot in his mouth every time he opens it. He calls Thomas, who doubts and needs physical verification, even though he already knows that Christ is eternal. He called me, even with all my mistakes, even with my impatience, even with my difficulties in life. He called me, and he's called you. And so this morning as we start, who's your one? I want you to start praying through God, who's my one? And as we do that, I want to encourage you and I want to show you in Matthew 4, we're going to pick up in verse 18, that Jesus Christ has called you. Are you willing? Let's read this passage together and then we'll pray. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of De Zebedee and John his brother. In the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. 
Let me pray for us. Father, we come here this morning, Lord, and I pray that we would be willing. And I praise you that you've chosen us. And Lord, I pray that we would see ultimately evangelism is about spending more time with you. It's about building this relationship with you and inviting others into the most important thing we have. God, I pray that we would leave all and that we would reproduce in our faith. That we would open our mouths even when we think it's going to be awkward. But Father, that we would plan for those opportunities. Lord, we pray for more opportunities. We pray for the wisdom to see those opportunities and the boldness to take them. Father, right now I ask for you to impress one name on every person in this room. Father, that they would know who's that person they need to pray for and they need to share the gospel with. That they wouldn't limit it to that one person, but Lord, that they would seek out every opportunity over the next month to tell them about you. In your name we pray. Amen. Verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, this is Jesus' new residence. He has been living here for quite some time. In fact, we know that he already knew Peter and Andrew because they were followers of John the Baptist. They were his disciples. And John the Baptist had already told him, that's the Messiah. That's the man we've been waiting for. He's the one. And so they've probably been hanging out with Jesus at least in some part. They've been going and listening to him preach. They've been listening to him teach. He hasn't done any miracles yet, but they're intrigued by what this man has to say. And so they've begun to follow him in part. But what I want you to see is that verse 18, he goes to these men and he calls them out of their old lifestyle to give up everything they hold dear. I don't know what you've heard about being a fisherman, in ancient world, it was not despised. It was not looked down upon. You probably stunk, and maybe that's one reason people would give you a little space. But it was not despised as, say, a shepherd would be. These men were not the lowest of the low, but they were not rich and powerful either. These men were everyday guys. They had normal jobs. They were normal people. They had very little education. And Jesus Christ goes to them. He goes to the fishermen. You see, the first thing I want you to hear is that Jesus Christ uses the willing, not necessarily the powerful, not necessarily the wisest, not necessarily the smartest. Jesus Christ will use you if you are willing. It's amazing to me that the same Spirit that dwelled inside the Apostle Paul dwells inside me. The same Spirit that was inside Moses dwells inside me. The same Spirit that empowered David as a teenager to take on this uh, incredibly tall person, nine and a half feet tall Goliath was. The same Spirit that led David to that victory and led him for the rest of his life dwells inside of me. Now, I'm probably not called to fight a giant. I'm probably never going to be Billy Graham or Paul and preach to millions. But I am called to preach to the people around me. I am called to open my mouth and tell them the message of Jesus Christ. The question is, are you willing? None of these men were powerful. In fact, I'd argue that Matthew had zero social standing. He was a tax collector, and yet Jesus chose him. If you are willing, then Christ will use you, and you will look back on your life, and you will be amazed at the things he's done. The other day, I registered for a conference uh, for my wife and I in Augusta. It's a marriage conference through family life. It's an incredible conference. We've done it before. Anyway, I registered and a guy immediately texted me back from family life and said, hey, you were at Southeastern and then you were a pastor in North Carolina. Have I got a story for you? And I went, oh no, this guy knows me. <laughs> and I told Kelly, I was like, it, it just worries me. How far back does he know me? Like that's I remember looking back on my life and going, there's no way God wants me to be a pastor. There's no way God wants to use me. All the mistakes I've made, all the stories this guy could probably tell. And yet Jesus Christ has used me. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. If you are willing to be used by Jesus Christ, He will use you to change someone's eternity. And there is nothing greater in life, nothing than knowing that you were part of someone's spiritual conversion. That God used you to tell them about the hope of Jesus Christ. 
While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Who started this relationship? Now, obviously, they began to follow Jesus around some and listen to his teaching. But at this point, they're still disciples of John the Baptist. Jesus goes and he finds them and he says, you two, follow me. And then a few verses later, he does the exact same thing with James and John. Scripture presents us as spiritually destitute. There is no way on my own I could choose salvation. There's no way on my own I could choose a relationship with God because I didn't even realize how sinful I was. But the gospel, well, there's an example. It's a silly example, but I think it works. Someone's drowning in a pool. They're unconscious. They have no idea they're drowning. The lifeguard comes up and hooks them. And as he hooks them, they wake up. And he says, look, I'm going to pull you in. That person can choose to fight back. They can choose to try and pull the lifeguard. They can fight that person. Or in a spiritual example, they can say, yes, Lord, I want to be saved. Jesus Christ chooses us. He comes in and He pokes our heart and He says, something's missing inside of you. And what's missing is me. Now, I believe that all have that opportunity. That whosoever will may come. The Lord is willing that none should perish. I believe that at some point in everyone's life, God comes in and He pokes their heart. He knocks on the door of their heart according to Revelation 3.20. But I want you to understand that you were destitute and yet Jesus chose you. I remember, this is an embarrassing story. Most of my stories are embarrassing. When I was in elementary school, so I was homeschooled third grade through 10th grade, but when I was in first and second grade, the real popular thing at elementary school was soccer. I hated soccer. And I was awful at it. Uh, but I was usually the biggest kid up until like fifth grade. I was the biggest kid. I was usually one of the strongest. I was usually the fastest. Boy, how things change. Anyway, I remember for baseball and stuff like that, I always got picked first at recess. But when it came around to soccer, Aaron was usually the last one standing. There was a kid half my height who didn't have an athletic bone in his body. He got picked before me. I don't remember much from second grade, but I remember that humiliating moment. If God were to line up people and pick them according to their abilities, Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. The least of these. I call myself the chief of sinners. I don't deserve to be here yet. Jesus Christ didn't pick me last. He picked me with His Son. The first fruits. He picked me to have an eternal relationship with me. He chose to have a relationship with me. And he came and he said, Aaron, you need me for an eternity. But I'm not just going to call you to work. No, your first responsibility. Look there at verse 19. He said to them, follow me. Your first responsibility is to be with me. As part of my team, your first responsibility is to know me. It's to walk with me. It's to live with me. It's to build this relationship with me. It's to go to worship. It's to study the Scriptures. It's to spend time in prayer. Your first responsibility is to build your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's more important than anything else. Are you spending time in God's Word? Are you spending time with Him? I can't physically follow Jesus around today. But you know, I can read about the important things he said and did right here. I can read his word and I can see what he would say to me. Go you therefore into all the world and make disciples. He's talking to me. I can see that I'm called to love my neighbor, that I'm called to help the people around me. You see, if you don't have a close personal walk with Jesus, there's not going to be much motivation to tell people about him. You remember your first date with your spouse? Don't talk about any other first dates, but your first date with your spouse. When you got home that night, or when you got back to your dorm room, or your apartment, or wherever you were, what'd you do? I immediately called some of my closest friends. I met her. I met her. I knew very quickly. I met the woman I'm going to marry and spend the rest of my life with. I was so ecstatic. I wanted to tell everybody I met, had a picture of her on my phone. Yeah, this is the girl I'm dating. I wanted to, tell, I wanted to brag. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's funny. I wanted to tell the world about how great she was. 
It needs to be like that with Christ. Let me tell you about the man who saved my soul. Let me tell you about the man who, who gave me an eternal inheritance. We talked about that this morning in Sunday school. Maybe you did too. When we think about an inheritance, you think about the money you're going to get when your parents or grandparents pass away. Maybe the property or the stuff. And we do anything to get that property. We'll sign wills and we'll witness things and we'll go to probate court. But we won't crack our Bible open and spend time with Jesus five minutes a day. We won't go to Bible study. We won't come to worship because other things take priority. We're not talking about $100,000. We're not talking about a tractor or some vehicles. We're talking about an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ that will fulfill every desire and every need you've ever had in your heart. Jesus Christ gave us His life. Let's spend it with Him. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus Christ has called us to reproduce. He's called us to go out and tell other people this good news, this good message. Now, I don't know about you, but if I fished for a living and Jesus said, hey, I'm going to put you in front of people, I'd be like, I'm all about it. Some of you would be like, no, I'd rather go catch fish. I don't want to talk in front of people. But you see, Jesus Christ called these men. Peter talks constantly throughout the New Testament. Peter's constantly running his mouth. How much does Andrew say? When was the last time you heard a story about Andrew? Andrew's the behind-the-scenes guy. Now, when he does talk, it's spot on and it's good. But he's the behind-the-scenes guy. How about uh, uh, James and John? We don't hear nearly as much from James as we do from John. John's the beloved apostle. He writes several books of the New Testament. But this James, we don't hear much out of him. You see, you don't have to be the spokesperson. You don't have to be the one preaching to the crowd. But as we're going to see in a few weeks, Jesus can use the quiet people. Jesus can use the ones who build really strong relationships with one or, uh, one or two others to tell them the gospel. But all of us in our own way, using the giftings we've been given by God, are called to reproduce. It might be through music, right? It might be through personal just relationships. It might be through sports. Now that also might cause fights. But most of the time, you can use it to share the gospel with somebody. Might be literature. Yeah, reading. As you talk about the good and bad things that happen in a novel, why do you enjoy it so much when a hero wins? Because our heart's longing for a hero to win. And guess what he did? His name's Jesus Christ. The hero won. Anything you do, whatever God's given you pleasure in, those things that are not sinful, you can use to share the love of Jesus Christ. And now the question is how? Start planning through that. Who's that person? Who's that person you're going to write down on your card? What do they really enjoy? Now, if someone really, really enjoys reading, I'm not going to go up to them and say, hey man, let's go hunting. Right, let's go do something you absolutely hate and I'm going to share the gospel with them while I'm there. No, I'm going to meet them halfway. You really enjoy reading. All right, what are you reading right now? I'll read it with you. Let's get together and talk about it. I'm going to find ways to reproduce my faith. But before we get there, look at verse 20. Immediately, immediately, they left their nets and followed Him. Immediately. And then look at verse 22. Immediately, James and John, they left the boat and their father and followed Him. We can't keep one foot in sin and try and serve Christ. We can't hold on to these pet sins or this old lifestyle and choose to worship Jesus with the rest of our time. Jesus will have all of you or He will have none of you. He didn't tell the guys, hey, keep fishing and on your free time come and serve Me. No, He called them to vocational ministry. He called these guys to give up their jobs. To, in part, give up their families and follow Him. He called them to radical sacrifice and radical service. Jesus Christ is calling us to give up what we used to hold dear and instead... Find joy in Jesus Christ. Now, why would He do that? Why must we give up our old lifestyle? When I was in high school, I never succeeded in this. I think you'll know that. But when I was in high school, one of my goals, as it is for most high school students, is to be popular. I never succeeded. Travis is going to make fun of me for that. 
I never succeeded in that. Why? Well, in part because I was a nerd. Um, In part because I was active with a Christian group. And people knew when I was talking to them, I was going to invite them to Bible study. And I'm going to tell you, that gets on people's nerves after a while. (laughs) There's a nice way to do that, and there's a rude way to do that. I wasn't very good at it. My lifestyle was different, not all the time, but in a lot of different ways. I didn't do the things they did. They were never going to accept me within their circle. I wouldn't get drunk. I wouldn't do drugs. Some of us are trying to be popular with the world and be a good Christian. And I want you to understand that those two things are mutually exclusive. This world hates Christians. When you say abortion is sinful... This world instantly hates you. When you say homosexual marriage is sinful, they instantly hate you. You have to decide who you serve. You have to decide who you will follow. And if Jesus Christ is who you claim to follow, then He's calling you to radically abandon everything you hold dear and hold dear what He holds dear. Which means my life from now on is about building my relationship with Him and reproducing my faith. Now over the next few weeks, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick that person. And every day I want you to pray for him. It can be a short prayer. Jesus, help me to share the Gospel with this person. Jesus, give me opportunities to tell them about the love of Christ. Every day pray for them. Read that passage and pray that passage over them. Father, help me to help to apply these truths to their lives. And then, I want you to invite them to church. I want you to invite that person to church. Not just church, but invite them to live life with you. If you're going hunting and they enjoy hunting, invite them to go hunting with you. If you enjoy fishing and they enjoy fishing, invite them to go fishing with you. Focus on building a relationship with these people that you might take them to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we do not plan for evangelism, it will not happen. That's why I love that this month we're doing the Janie Chapman offering for state missions. If we don't take up special missions offerings, sometimes it gets pushed to the wayside. The whole month of September, we're taking up offerings for Janie Chapman. These are above and beyond your regular tithes. Not a dime of that money stays in this church. It goes straight to telling other people about Jesus Christ in the state of South Carolina. I want everything we do as a church to reinforce the Great Commission, to go and tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, are you willing to serve? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to open your mouth? Are you willing to give? And if you say, Aaron, that's way more than I can do on my own, you're 100% right. Peter tried to do a lot of stuff under his own power, and he got himself in trouble a lot. But it was when he finally surrendered to Jesus Christ in John 21 where Jesus says, do you love me? Three times. And Peter says, you know I do. It's there that Peter becomes a new man. Are you willing to surrender all you have to Jesus Christ that you might change someone's eternity? Go out and share the gospel with somebody. Travis is going to come forward and lead us in a closing hymn. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you have questions. Maybe I've confused you. That's highly possible. Come and talk to me. Maybe you have a question about what this might look like practically. How do I practically share my faith? I already had one Bible study invite me into their home to give them practical ways to share their faith. I'd love to come and do that with you and your family. I've got lots of different things we could go through. But ultimately, here's the thing. You don't need special tips and tricks. You simply need to be willing because God chose you to be a part of His story.